Hello everyone and welcome to a new edition of Latin America This Week at the Brazilian Report. My name is Ignacio Portes and I will be joined shortly by Lucas Berti, our Latin American specialist. We will be talking this week about the death of Pablo Neruda, the Chilean poet and Nobel laureate. Did he die of natural causes, as we used to think? Or was he murdered by the Pinochet dictatorship in 1973? So, hello, Lucas. Good to be with you again. Hello, Nacho. Thanks for having me. Let's talk about this interesting story in Latin America today. All right. So, first, for our audience that maybe is not so versed in Latin America, could you tell us a little bit about who was Pablo Neruda and why is this so important to Chile and to Latin America and why this event 50 years ago suddenly has such a big importance? Uh, sure, Nacho. I think the first thing to talk about Neruda is, is uh, his official name is not Pablo Neruda. Uh, the poet uh, was born as Ricardo Eliezer Neftali Reyes Pazuan. And he always started to use the name Pablo Neruda in the 1920s after he was already like uh, involved in his work as an author. And for example, uh, he spent the most part of the 20th century, the first decades of the century, studying and working mostly as a consul, as a diplomat. And he, after some studies, he went back to Chile in 1932. He did a lot of travels and went to Buenos Aires to work as a consul. And then in 1934, he was named a consul in Spain. And that's an important shift in the career of, of Neruda because in 1936, we had the, the beginning of the civil war in Spain. And Neruda was designated to work as a consul in France, and he played an important, a very important role there during the crisis. So uh, if you guys want to, to know a little bit more about how Neruda played an important role in diplomatic terms during the Spanish civil war, I recommend you the book, A Long Battle of the Sea, from Chilean author Isabel Allende who talks a little bit more about the refugees adaptation and how Neruda played a role of uh, on bringing those refugees, those Spanish refugees, to, to Chile. And well, after this, these events, uh, he, he goes back to Chile and starts uh, new, new, new positions in diplomatic terms. And in 1940, I guess, he goes to, the, to Mexico City to as well work as a consul general. And one important thing not to say here, considering the political career of Neruda, is the second shift in his career, which happened in 1945, when Neruda was elected a communist senator for the northern provinces in Chile of Antofagasta and Tarapacá, that stay in the Atacama Desert. And a few months later, he officially joined the Communist Party in Chile, which was like the seed of his political career. Right. And uh, Neruda then so became had like a double role, right? He was on the one hand uh, a recognized author, and on the other side an important politician, and this made him a, a massive figure, right? Eventually, he would uh, join the famous left-wing government of Salvador Allende in the seventies. How how did that happen? How did it turn out? And yeah, what did Chile look like at the time? Here. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. this the thing. The, the interesting thing here is like right before. He went to, the, to, to be close to the politics in Chile. There were some years in Chile that the communists were persecuted. And there was even some laws that put the Communist Party into an illegal term. So, for example, if you were a communist during the, the 40s and the 50s in Chile, you had some problems. And Neruda even had to live in exile. And then he came back, he came back to Chile and was really close to Salvador Allende. For, for instance, uh, Neruda was first nominated as a candidate in Chile for the, for the Chilean presidency in 1970, but he, did, he later ended up giving up of the, of the candidacy and supported Salvador Allende instead. And Salvador Allende was later elected, to, uh, I think we can say, Chile's first democratically elected socialist head of state. And well, there were some, 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 some important things happening in Chile at the time. Uh, we had the, the, socialist, the, the socialist movement around so the regime that gained some power and Neruda was very close to them. And well, after the, the agenda was elected in 1970 and three years later, unfortunately, you have like a coup d'etat that happened under the auspice of military dictator uh, Augusto Pinochet. And here is the, the, the cornerstone of what we're going to 
going to talk today about the mysterious death of Neruda that happened only 13 or 12 days after the military coup of September 11 of 1973. Right. As I understand, uh, like the official story goes like he was an ambassador uh, during that government. He was working abroad and he had to come back because of his illness. And then, well, he died coincidentally uh, at the time the coup happened. But there is now a different version. So what was the official version of his death? And uh, what is the alternative version that we're starting to see now? Yeah, yeah the thing is, shortly, uh, like shortly after Allende was elected, he appointed Neruda as the Chilean ambassador to France, and he stood there for, for, for two years, from 1970 to 1972. So he kept his diplomatic position, but like shortly, uh, when, uh, and after the, the military coup happened in 1973, he died under mysterious circumstances, and as of I guess the beginning, the beginning of the of this millennium, people consider that the Neruda died of 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 prostate cancer. This is the first version, but as of 2000, 2012, I guess the former driver of Neruda came up with some theories that he might have been poisoned by the military dictatorship, which is we need to say to our audience, which is something very common during the military dictatorships in Latin America across the entire sentence. The Chilean dictatorship that lasts from 1973 to 1990 uh, had more than 3,000 people killed, more than 3, 000, uh, 30,000 people tortured. So it was it would be just one, of, one more abuse of human rights and one more atrocity under the dictatorship. So that's the theory. Right. That they had a lot of impunity to do what they what they wanted. They, they were yeah. for for decades. They were in con full control of Chile and had people disappeared and even tortured at the national stadium. Like everything was was game, right? They was yeah. they were not very controlled at all. What like there was no rule of law, basically. Yeah, it was also a time that we do, we didn't have so much cameras, so much pressure in terms of social media. So things like could happen behind a curtain during dictatorships, and people wouldn't notice. Right, right. But there is an alternative version uh, about how how he died, and we're going to see a little bit more about that. But before that, uh, let me take a minute to ask our subscribers, to ask our, our, our listeners and the people following this live stream to, if they can, uh, take a look at our website, Brazilian.report, the Brazilian Report, which is the engine behind uh, this live stream that we're doing and behind everything we do. Uh, it has uh, the option of subscribing in different tiers that go from $1 onwards. And you can help us a lot by subscribing and you can access uh, our newsletters. We have daily newsletters, weekly newsletters about Brazil, about Latin America. Uh, we have uh, website articles with daily, with the latest analysis and reporting on what's happening in Brazil and our own region. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great option to stay, to stay up to date with the latest that is going on. And if you cannot subscribe, you have an alternative option, which is donating uh, to our co to our coffee mugs at Brazil at Buy Me a Coffee uh, slash Brazilian Report. You can see uh, the QR code in the right corner of our screens uh, that you can scan it and and uh, elect to donate uh, to make a one time donation or to donate more than one time to help us do this website. So those are your, your two basic uh, options to contribute to what we're doing. You can subscribe to any plan from, from $1 on, or you can fill our coffee mugs at, at buy me a coffee slash Brazilian report. So Lucas, we were saying, uh, we had this, this official version of the death of Neruda, prostate cancer shortly after Pinochet takes over. And now we have this alternative version that maybe uh, someone somehow killed him. So what is this? Uh, how did they kill him uh, in this new new theory? And how does this hypothesis come out? And what what's the latest news on this on these uh, alternative theories? So the thing is, after the, well, Neruda died in 1973. But just one thing, 1971, Neruda was granted a Nobel Prize in Literature. One thing is very worth yes. explaining because he was the second Chilean person to receive a Nobel Prize. But well, right. That made him internationally back. famous, right? That, yeah, that's was, what. Yeah, it was one of the things that made him famous. But like already here, like in close years of, of in recent times, after this theory came up, 
uh, a lot of people start wondering, like, okay, we have a military dictatorship in Chile that was really capable of doing that. So maybe we, we need to start investigating. And the first thing that happened to as a shift in that case is that the, the, the bodies, the, the dead remains of Pablo Neruda began to be exhumed as some kind of murder probe because people would now to, uh, need to investigate the mortal remains to see if there was some indication that the case was not a death, a, a regular death, but, but yes, instead of that, uh, a murder. And well, the things, the, the, the case had a lot of turnarounds. Some new turns happened because first we have this, 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 this denunciation from his former driver, Manuel Araya, who tell the press in 2011 or 2012, I guess, that the poet could have been poisoned by the dictatorship. In, 2000, in 2013, they began to assume his mortal remains, and a team of Chilean experts and foreign experts began to reaffirm that he died of, of prostate cancer. But, however, in 2015, new studies in Chile and also in, in, in abroad uh, they detected the presence of a bacteria that could have been put inside. Neruda, by the time he was being treated with, uh, with his reported disease uh, shortly after the military coup. So we have a lot of things happening uh, between the, 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 this, this 2012 theory and what we have today. But the, recent, the most recent news, I think that you can explain a little, a little bit more about what happened this week, but I think mostly what happened is there's, there was some, a new report uh, with new information regarding the existence of this bacteria that could have been put inside Neruda. And we have like some kind of family discussion here. I think it's, it's basically, it's mostly something like this. Yeah, uh, I, I, from what we, what the, the latest piece of news that we covered in, in this week's newsletter is that uh, the botulism that they found in Neruda's body is apparently also not just located uh, uh, close to his body on, or superficially, but also inside the pulp of his teeth, which yeah. uh, supposedly means that it was present in his body while he was alive. It could not simply be contamination from the grave, from the soil of the grave, that the, the bacteria that causes botulism is in an, a, a part of the body that would not have been uh, possible to contaminate by accident. So this is apparently what, what, the, what the complaint is saying and and the the judge will investigate these claims but as you were saying not everyone seems to be pushing the story right there's part of the family that says that maybe he was murdered and that they want to 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 push this line of investigation and some others are not so convinced yeah the thing is the the, the one person from the family who is called rodolfo reis is a lawyer in the, in the nephew of the of the Ruda. He is the one like championing the campaign to help to investigate what he says is a clear murder against his, his uncle, his, his uncle. But at the same time, there's there, there's also some part of Neruda's family. Uh, there is not only a guy named Bernardo Hayes, another another person, another relative of Neruda, who says that uh, the process, the current process, can really prove what happened in the past. And at the same time, the judge who is like dealing with the with this, the extensive report that, that's, that came out this week says that they don't want to to give uh, they don't want to give conclusions so fast they need to investigate it first so but but the thing is during the week the nephew the nephew Rodolfo already said that that his uncle was murdered so it caused a frenzy a lot of headlines around the world said okay now we have the official version but it's not the official version yet because they have to do some investigation first. But well, in the meantime, uh, we have a lot of news saying that uh, what happened to Luda was indeed a murder. And now we have also this right. family discussion of people that support the theory of, 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 of a possible murder and people that support that uh, this case don't need to be to have uh, new updates. So I think we have, in the following right. days, in the following months and the following days, we will have some, some updates as well. Right. And it seems like Chile is undergoing a, a revision of his past of some kind, because here in Argentina, um, the, the legacy of the dictatorship has been extensively discussed for, I would say, decades now. There's mm -hmm. been the former uh, generals of the military juntas that we had all over the continent 
went to trial. They, many of them went to jail. They went through appeals processes. The, the, the courts, court trials were televised. People had have the, the families of the victims have had the chance to investigate what happened to to most of them. Maybe not to all, but most of them. They're having very extensive revision of the of the violent uh, times uh, of the state sponsored violence during the during the 70s and 80s in Argentina. But uh, this has not been the case throughout Latin America. And I think what we're seeing now in other countries, and Chile is a prime example of this, is this will to finally, after years in which maybe the left didn't want to dig so deep into the past, and maybe the, let's just have a peaceful transition to democracy and not uh, stir the pot too much. Now we're finally starting to see a push to see really who got killed, how, who was responsible. How, do you do you think this is somehow linked that 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 Chile is finally starting to see some some revision of, of its past, and it, it has the Neruda case has a little to, a little bit of relationship with the general context of the country. Well, I think it, it has a relation because first I have to remember that in 2019 Chile had the so-called Estallido Social, which was like a nationwide protest that happened in Chile, which began to it started with some metro price tickets, but it started to to put all the, the, the Chilean society in a debate about things that happened under the, the military dictatorship, a lot of things regarding the people's daily lives and, and the constitution as well. And I think after, there is like a before and after the Estagino Social of 2019, because after that, Chileans from most part of the spectrum began to, to review and try to, to settle new debates about what happened to Chile during the 70s and the 80s and what was the legacy of the dictatorship in nowadays Chile. So I think, well, uh, it's, it's interesting that you, you said about like the relations of this that different Latin American countries regarding their past, because we have, uh, for example, Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay, which were uh, equally submitted to military dictatorships during in the end of the 20th century, but they have like a different relation on talking in the past. In the meantime, we have, for example, Brazil, which had like a present uh, uh, until 2021, until 2022, which was always championing the return of the military dictatorship. So uh, we have different uh, uh, different levels of countries dealing with its pasts. So I think Chile is beginning slowly, step by step, to 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 dealing with this issue. And of course, we have countries that, that deal with it a little bit more than others. But I think Chile uh, is already doing that since 2020, uh, 2019. And the Neruda case could be uh, also uh, a trigger to constantly talking about, about what happened in Chile in the recent decades. Right. So we'll see We'll see if the, the government of President uh, Gabriel Boric, uh, which is kind of the first uh, really left-wing president that Chile has yes. had since Allende, uh, because Chile had some central-left governments, maybe but more moderate and that didn't want to get into this, these areas. But... Uh, Boric um, upholds the legacy of Allende sometimes in, in his speeches and uh, wants to um, review some of some of what happened in, in this era. Um, so maybe this this is a push forward to um, a push to 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 revise some some of the, of, of what happened in, in in Chile during during that era. Now that that they have a government that that it's maybe more ideologically close to to what was uh, in, uh, at the in time your... before the COVID. Yeah, you know, we're saying about like how Chile began to, to, to speak about that. And well, Boric, we can say that Boric is like a product, a, a political product of what happened in Chile in 2019. So maybe yeah. uh, that's that he's part of this process, I guess. Right. He was a leader of those protests, right? And uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so I think that's that's a, a good summary of, of, the, of what, what's happening in Chile and what what happened a long time ago in Chile, and we don't maybe we're still don't know fully how it transpired. But uh, keep keep following the Brazilian report for the latest, not just in this case and not just on this country, but on all of Brazil and all of the region in our weekly Latin American newsletter uh, and in our weekly and daily Brazilian newsletters and articles. Uh, so thank you, Lucas, for being with us today, and uh, thank all of you, our our audience. To, for following us again on this Latin American Live. And see you next time.